Welcome back to the Gentle Counselor podcast. My name is Crystal and I support mums through their inner healing and parenting journeys. For those of you listening right now, this episode is a little bit different because back in October of 2021, it was World Mental Health Day and I had some wonderful friends join me over three days to talk all about mental health and motherhood at the Aussie Moms Mental Health Virtual Event. I hope you enjoyed these conversations, which were recorded live at the summit. I'm also thrilled to let you know that we will be returning in 2022 and plan on making it even bigger and better. It may or may not involve a retreat. (laughs) Wherever you are right now, I hope these episodes find you when you truly need it. I would love to hear your feedback on these chats. So make sure you're connected with me on social media at The Gentle Counselor. If you'd like to receive an email once a month that is full of freebies, parenting tips, links to podcast episodes, beautiful affirmation screensavers, and other goodies, make sure you are signed up to my email list. I hope you enjoy this chat. Hello, everyone. We've um, we've turned the tables. You get <laughs> me as your like little Eva host now. Um, so I get to host tonight and we are talking to Crystal um, for our very last session of the three-day event. So we've talked to so many people. Crystal has talked to so many people. Um, and now it's Crystal's turn. So Crystal is going to be talking to us. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about you? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And firstly, I want to acknowledge Sarah as being so instrumental in this whole event. Um, She's been working really hard with me behind the scenes, getting all this ready for the past like six months, I think it was, that that we first talked about doing this event again. Um, So thank you so much. I appreciate you so much. Um, And yes, I'm very excited to be presenting this last session for our three-day event at the Aussie Moms Mental Health virtual event. Um, it's a bit, I feel a bit surreal right now because I can't believe we're at the end of it, but, um, I'm so grateful to everyone who has been supporting this event and to all the speakers that we've had and to everyone that's joined us. We are actually almost about to hit our goal of 500 members, which is really exciting. And I'm curious to see how that goes because we're going to keep promoting this and have everything open for replays for the next two weeks. So for me, when I was thinking about the topic that I want to talk about, I couldn't get past this notion of grief and loss, Um, but I didn't want to talk about what we are typically told grief is, which is when, um, you know, someone dies and it's about death. I believe that we also experience grief and loss in other areas of our life. So we're going to be talking a bit more about that today. So if you're not familiar with me, I probably should have done this at the beginning. My name is Crystal. I'm from The Gentle Counselor, where I provide online resources to support the mental health and well-being of parents and children. I specialize in supporting mothers um, and I do a lot of stuff over on Instagram, mostly at The Gentle Counselor, and I um, do private counseling sessions. I'm a circle security parenting facilitator. Um, What else? I do all the things. I have a membership called Gentle Motherhood, which is more supporting us in our inner healing and parenting journeys as well because part of why I created the gentle counselor is because I believe it's really important to not only meet the needs of our children but to meet the needs of ourselves as well so finding that balance in between because I found that so much focus was on children which is great um we love that for gentle attachment parenting but um in my own experience and with a lot of the clients that I work with I noticed that we're missing out on um maternal mental health and we need to address that we need more support and help and we're going to talk a bit about that um, more in our chat today as well because it will kind of link in but to start off with um, the first we're kind of going to talk about three topics when we're talking about this notion of the unnoticed grief and loss and the first is going to be about miscarriage and pregnancy loss The second is going to be about the shift that we experience in motherhood and the grief and loss that can come in that. And we're going to be talking about the number one thing in all of our lives right now, which is a pandemic and grief and loss in what's showing up there. So we'll get into that in a minute. So to start off with, um, we thought it'd be really nice to 
do something together. Um, I'd like to invite you to light a candle or something if you have it nearby. And Sarah's going to explain it in a moment why that is. So just quickly, if you have a candle near you, so Sarah and I have ours, um, and a lighter, or if you're watching this as a replay, maybe you want to quickly pause the video and get yourself set up. Because um, we just thought we'd like to do something a bit special together first. Yeah. And um, we want to say too that these topics may be heavy. So if you're not in a place where you're able to listen to these topics, feel free to come back to this another day. You know, we'll have the replays available on Crystal's podcast so you can come back to these another day. These may be heavy topics. Mm. Um, so, Crystal, did you want to give the details for Lifeline and a couple of other resources now just while we're thinking about it if people do need to reach for some extra support? Yeah, what I'll probably do is I'll come back to this and put them all in the yeah. chat because I know my brain's going to fail me right now. I'm pretty sure Lifeline is, <laughs> oh, I want to say 13, 14, 11, but I could be wrong. So I'll come back to the chat and put it in because there's also Panda, which is a great resource. So I'll make yeah. sure to come back in. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So as we're talking about these topics, if this is feeling really heavy, please do reach out. Um, but as we talk through this, hopefully you will be left feeling seen and heard mm. and supported. Um, so what we're going to do now is um, just light a candle. So this actually comes from October 15th is um, Pregnancy Loss and Infancy Loss Remembrance Day. So we take a moment just to think about um, the babies who have been lost at any stage of pregnancy, and I mean any stage of pregnancy and post-birth as well, and we just take a moment to remember remember them, say their names and recognise um, recognize that they existed and recognise the loss and the impact that that has made in our lives as experiencing that as well. Mm -hmm. So if you do have a candle um, nearby, please feel free to light it. Otherwise, um, I, I'd love to invite you to join in in other ways, whether that's writing their name on a piece of paper or jumping into the comments and sharing. If you would like to share with us their name, their birth date, um, what makes you think of them, you know, feel free to, um, to acknowledge and recognise that as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to pretend like we're all sitting together and I've got this beautiful um, crystal clearing this I'm going to spray. So let's just take a deep breath together um, as I give this a bit of a spritz just to kind of clear our minds and trust and ground us um, in preparation for a bit of a heavier topic. So deep breath in. And deep breath out. I also have a beautiful roller that I had someone gift to me when I went through my miscarriage at the beginning of the year. So if you have um, any oils or rollers that you might like to apply and the candle I'm going to be lighting as well, actually, um, my beautiful friend also gifted me. So I felt very um, supported actually when I had my miscarriage by all my beautiful friends and friends that are online friends, um, that have become friends in person, which is wonderful, makes such a big difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, is there anything sorry. you'd like to say, Sarah, about your experience? No. Or? Mm. oh yeah would you like me to share now or later it's totally up to you um I I'll, I can go first if you like it's just funny having the tables turned um <laughs> so if people have been following me for a while they probably already know that the very start of the year um I had an early miscarriage so almost as soon as we saw those two lines and started getting excited about it um almost as quickly it went away so it's amazing how much changes and how much of a future you can plan in like three days because that's oh, yeah. what I did. I, I literally even ordered like pregnancy um, tablets and things like that. That, of course, was really fun to get in the mail like a month later. Um, and that was really, it was hard in so many weird ways because as I was going through the miscarriage, I didn't tell anyone about it other than my husband. And so for me, that was a lot of the unnoticed grief and losses. I, I think a lot of us perhaps are alone when we first go through it. And that can be really challenging. 
Um, also for me, because I had an early pregnancy, so what is it, a uh, chemical pregnancy, I think they call it when it's an early loss, but in that first like three weeks or whatever it is. Um, then I had this weirdness about feeling like I had to prove it. That was really hard. Maybe that was possibly the hardest thing because I remember as I saw that line fade and I took a million tests, like it was, it was pregnant and I've had two children and I literally had the same symptoms. Um, I knew, which is why I took the test because we weren't planning it or anything. So it was a happy surprise really. Um, and I remember crying to my husband and just saying like, I feel like I'm going crazy. Like, did I make this up? And he, and he was so good, thankfully, at reassuring me and saying, like, I saw the lines too. Like, it's real. It happened. Like, we're experiencing this. Um, and I think that was the worst of it for me was just that real initial part of it. Um, and what I found really helpful for me was I wrote a lot in my phone in those moments when I was feeling really alone. Um I, I don't know how comfortable I feel sharing my full experience with it, but let's just say I, I was alone in, in a lot of sense, um, despite my husband um, as well. Uh, it, I wasn't supported very well when it happened. Um, my support came also after. So once I felt comfortable, I shared it online because I've built such a beautiful community of people online. Um, and I wanted to talk about it because I, I knew I needed to. I wanted to for the people just like me as well that were going through it. Um, and that was just part of my process. I just felt that urge to share. And I'm really glad I did because I was absolutely flooded with so many beautiful messages and support from people. Um, like I said, pe like people sent me gifts, like beautiful things. And it was a nice way that I allowed that in because if I didn't tell anyone, they wouldn't know how to... I, you know, it's like, let people love you kind of thing. Um, and so that was really nice. So that was very healing in itself um, to engage in conversations with other people because I knew it was common as well. Um, so that didn't surprise me, the amount of people that I had messages from, but it was just the absolute kindness and beautiful messages I had and follow-up messages like two weeks or three weeks later, like checking in again made such a big difference for me. Um, and so my due date was September 23rd. That was a hard week in the lead up. I feel like every single day was a countdown to this moment. And it was almost worse because it was an early pregnancy, which means I literally had the entire like nine, 10 months um, of a countdown in my mind constantly every day, like every day. It was really awful. Um, for that first week when it happened, I had to go back to work and I didn't want to tell people um for a few reasons because the place I was working at like to make everyone's private life very public and I didn't want that um and so I had a long drive so I would literally cry my eyes out on the way to work put my makeup on in the car hold it in as best I could all day sometimes I couldn't and then bore my eyes out all the way drive home <laughs> that was like my week after so which is good like I was able to get it out but I really wish I had just not gone to work as well which is really hard um, and so as a memory for me, um, firstly, we did get a plant, um, which died. So I don't recommend getting plants in hindsight. Um, that was an error <laughs> on our half. A very risky, beautiful idea, very risky. I can actually relate to that one. <laughs> so um, I actually have a tattoo instead. I'm going to see. Yeah. So I already had two tattoos um, to signify my children I have now. Um, and so I have like the outline one for the baby that we lost. Um, when I revisited the conversation with my husband and addressed about needing to be supported better, um, he did try a little bit harder, harder or just new to try, I guess. Um, that's yeah. a whole other topic in that is, is your support person needing to support you in a very particular way. Um, he did a little bit of research and shared with me the idea of the babies coming back to you. And that really sat with me. And I was very grateful that he shared that with me because I like that idea. I find a lot, a lot of hope in that message because we do hope to fall pregnant again. Um, and so I do believe like that child or that spirit might come back or 
I don't know I'm still sitting with it a bit I think it's nice to kind of explore it one of the things I had as well was a friend sent me a pregnancy loss like journaling um ebook or something and that had a couple of pages of worksheets and questions to come through and I that helped a lot too just to process it because I am a fan of journaling anyway so for me that was really helpful um unfortunately when I tried to bring it up with my psychologist for whatever reason they didn't quite talk about it I don't know what happened in that moment um it seemed to be brushed over so that was hard as well so yeah again it's it's been finding more support in community of my friends online who most of them have actually experienced it as well yeah and this is the thing like we we're taught not to talk about it and Mm. Um, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of this cultural stigma around talking about pregnancy before 12 weeks because yes. oh, what if you lose it? But then you're left alone. Like that's mm. the, the society sets mothers up, or you know, it sets them up to be alone in their grief mm. and to continue on like nothing happened, and to go to work like nothing happened, and to mm. you know, when we're when we're taught that we're supposed to carry that alone for 12 weeks that leaves you without community, you know, and when when you open up and you share about that, you find all of those people who spoke with you and you'll find that a lot of them may not have had a chance to talk about it before, yes. you know, especially if they had losses before that magical 12-week number. Mm. Um, a lot of them may have been looking for someone to give them permission to talk about it, you know. Yeah. It's just we we don't... We're, we're a bit scared of dealing with tricky feelings mm. and dealing with heavy feelings. And so I think it sets mums up to have to carry so much, yeah. women, women to carry so much emotional load. And, you know, talking to your partner as well, and then that brings in all those different things, you know, around love languages and communication styles and, you know, mm. all of those things sort of come into how we not just how we process and how they process but how you communicate that with each other yeah. um you know it's it's very complex it's mm. not a simple thing um, and it's not something that you've prepared for either because you don't no. know what's going to happen you don't realize it's going to happen um you don't no, even know I, how you're going to react yeah. really no yeah and I mean statistically one in four pregnancies yeah. ends in loss mm. you know statistically and I mean the majority of them are early losses but that yes, means yeah. in every in every group of friends when four of them get pregnant there's a good chance that mm. one of them is going to be left mm. dealing with grief um and, and I could was- have very easily missed mine it was honestly a fluke that I actually even knew for those couple of days that I was oh, because yeah. I could have just thought that my cycle was late really Um, It was just because I have pretty good instincts. And again, like I said, it was exactly like my other two pregnancy symptoms that I just knew. I was like, oh, I'm pretty sure I'm pregnant. And that's, um, and that's, you know how you mentioned like the wanting to almost prove your pregnancy. Mm. It was, I think, because we're not very good at dealing with some of these tricky emotions, we kind of need to justify having them. Yeah. And people can feel feel that sense of loss just over the idea that they might be pregnant you mm. know just over getting butterflies in their stomach and oh you know they start playing over the idea and you know maybe you download an app and you start thinking about oh what might the due date be you know just the idea you know that that sense of hope that sense of joy and wonder yeah. um th- those feelings can happen without actually needing to validate why they're there sometimes we just have these feelings Mm. Um, yeah yeah. and and before Sarah and I started this um live we were talking about how we haven't been taught how to process grief Mm -hmm. because there's such a stigma around it like with death for example like there's a lot we're, we're very scared of it um and and where that, that's a different thing to be shunned away like let's just ignore that's happening and be happy and live our lives kind of thing but also when we're like if we have that already with like physical loss like a physical grief I mean with someone dying like with death then 
it makes sense from that that things that are like what I'm coining as the unnoticed grief and loss is even harder yeah because it's like what are we comparing it to and a lot of times with pregnancy loss people um you can get some undesirable comments about being grateful it happened early um or being grateful you already have children or being excited that you can try again um all those things that we really you know don't like hearing um people are trying to be well-meaning but that also reflects their uncomfortability with it too yes and so that's put on to you as well so you're uncomfortable not knowing who or what you can share and then you've got other people making it very clear that they are not available for you to have any discussion with yeah so um I thought I'd share a little bit of my story now and it really highlights the inability to, as a, as a society, to deal with grief. Um, so it was my first pregnancy and um, we'd been married for about a year. Jeremy had just come back from Afghanistan and got pregnant very quickly. And by all means, it was, you know, relatively healthy pregnancy, no major concerns. I was small, but, you know, there wasn't really anything to worry about. And then one day she kicked like crazy, you know, just I, I'd never felt anything like it. And I felt really sick and really tired. And I went to the doctor and they told me everything's fine. Any movement is good. You know, any movement means they're fine. Mm. And in my gut, I knew something was wrong, but the doctor told me everything was fine. And then she stopped moving. Um, so I was, I actually don't remember exactly how far along I was when she stopped. It took me a couple of days to sort of really trust my gut and mm. go back. It was at Christmas time and we were remote with family and um, I was around about 27, 27 and a half weeks, I think. And um, those words, there's no heartbeat, like, the world stopped um I've never felt heartbreak like that and going through labor and then holding this baby that I knew I would never get to watch grow up mm. you know that's it's heavy and no one thinks they're gonna have to be the one to call their family and say what's happened no one thinks they're gonna be the one that hears those words um you can't plan for that you can't predict that sometimes we just get left with these really heavy awful feelings and learning how to process them mm. um so we were actually on holidays interstate at the time and um my husband and friend um really good friend they were trying with with all their hearts to help and this mm. this is what I mean highlighting the inability to actually talk about grief so in their best attempt to help me um they uh, my friend went through the house and took out all the baby stuff before we got mm. home so there was no cot there was no baby clothes the mobile was gone the little nursery had set up was all packed down so I didn't have to see any of, any of it when I got home by all attempts they were trying to help me they were trying to protect me from those feelings of grief but actually to process what had happened I needed to sit with that grief and I mm. needed to feel the feels and you know hold the things and and think about all the could have beens and then sit with what was um and that's like that's a tricky it's a tricky thing to navigate and people may approach that differently. You know, for someone else, that may have been what they needed. For yeah. me, um, for me, it really showed me that we don't like to talk about these feelings and so to protect ourselves, we sort of try to pretend that they're not there. Yes. And that has been my experience of how a lot of people have tried to approach things is, maybe we acknowledge it when it happens but then we sort of like tuck it in a corner and then pretend that pretend that those heavy feelings mm. weren't there and that's how we sort of deal with grief we're sort of entitled to feel them for a little while mm. 
and then we we hide them we bury them and we don't we don't talk about them but in actual fact they become part of our story yeah. you know they become part of part of our experience as people and as mothers and as families and as women in the community who are supporting other people those those feelings of grief that we experience through all of these different topics we're going to talk about they become part of our story Mm. yeah and when it comes to grief we have the loss where it hurts so deeply like that's that first initial moment and it's not about shifting that hurt to feeling healed or better right like this is very different it's it's not going to happen this is going to live with us forever yeah similar to the other talks that we're going to have it is going to live with you forever um so it's more about getting to a place of that loss but you have that adjustment yes where it is going through the stages of grief and and there's a few different ideas out there um most of them seem to follow the pattern of denial anger um bargaining and then depression and then acceptance um a lot of people that experience grief kind of realize that it's it's not this linear thing it can be this way and that way and this way and that way and back to here and back to there and and, you know all over the place uh and yeah I agree I think it's more that because even in, in my process it has gone through that it's gone through um denial so I had that a lot actually because unfortunately at the same time I went through my loss I had other health issues I was at the same time trying to address which included ultrasounds um and I remember having that thought of what if yeah what if the baby's still there and then it's like I had to go through it all over again and I remember it was like some student and I'm like sitting there and I'm like trying to explain to this kid. <laughs> I'll say that because I'm older now. I'm, I'm allowed to refer to any uni fresh student as a kid now because they seem like they're 12 when you're like 30. Um, I just remember having to try to explain to him like what I was going through. And it was such a weird experience. And for a really long time as well, I... Um, felt pain walking past the shopping aisles with the pregnancy test because they're always right right on the end which I never was aware of and then I became very hyper aware so it was like this little mm, like zing of pain each time took a couple of months to get over that actually I remember the day where I went huh I finally didn't feel that um or seeing other people like about where you you would have been or meeting other people with babies yeah um it seemed like everyone got pregnant at the same time (laughs) Yeah. Um, my best friend is actually due with her first, like literally any day now. Um, so then it was also realizing, wow, we could have gone through that together. Like it's such a weird space to be in. And I, and I know a few other people have had similar experiences where coincidentally, like their friend has been, has been pregnant at the same time or whatever it might be. And so that's hard too. too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think knowing that you kind of fluctuate between, um, like shock and feeling numbness even um having like emotional outbursts um feeling really lonely in it feeling guilt um because some people you know can place blame on themselves as as if we yeah. did something or had something to do with it um which feeling makes sense quite complicated like you're not yeah. restricted to just mm. feeling one feeling like you can feel happy for someone and also yes. simultaneously be feeling heavy feelings too you know we're not singular yes. feeling beings we can feel a whole spectrum of things yeah 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 and it's more about getting to that um place of of kind of re-entering into a space where you feel like you're adjusting and that's more to do with um like your relationships maybe you've established new relationships like with a support network or it's allowed you to go uh, deeper into some relationships. And I feel like that's kind of what happened for me. I feel like 
my husband and I have a deeper relationship because we went through that together and also had to process some of the not so great things through that process, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Friendships that I've had become deeper because of that shared experience as well. Um, and then you kind of have this new strength that you can find in going through that experience, um, like holding space for yourself and holding space for other people that have gone through it as well. And then from that can come things like hope, um, and helping others. A lot of people direct that energy into helping others as well when they've gone through it themselves. And so that's what I mean more when you come to that kind of adjustment period of, of what is this going to look and feel like for me now that I'm coming on the outside of, um, other side, I mean, of, of that grief stage. Um, but in saying that, you can still fluctuate back to those beginning stages where it is all about the loss and the hurt. I don't imagine September 23rd is going to be a happy day for me in the future. I, I imagine I'm going to constantly think of it every single year. And, you know, it it won't necessarily be, for, for me, it's not the due date. For me, it's Mother's Day. Mm. For me, in those moments when I see my children, like, sitting on the swing set in each other's arms and mm. suddenly I my heart hurts for... Mm you know, the fact that there's not someone else or when, you know, when my, we, we, we haven't hidden these feelings. We haven't hidden this part of our story. Our children know my seven-year-old tried is, has processed these feelings by naming her baby doll, Joanna. Mm. Um, And when she first came and told me that that was the doll's name, because she'd never, she'd had this baby since she was like 12 months old and she'd never named this doll. And then about probably 12 months or so ago, she must've just hit this level of awareness and processing Mm. and all that hit me you know it's Mm. it won't necessarily be the same things it'll be different things that just it washes over you like you know like a wave hitting the sand it just oh there it is you know and then it it settles again because I've uh, the best description I've come across for grief and I think this fits so many different sorts of grief is in the moment, in those early stages you were talking about, it's like it takes up the entire space of our lives, you know, it permeates into every cell. into It's like thick air. Yeah, Mm. and it's not that we move on or that it gets smaller, but life grows and fills with new experiences and new people and new joy and new hope and new dreams and it grows and it grows and that, that story, that thing that happened is still there. But it no mm. longer takes up the entire container of life, you know. And mm. every now and then, you know, the jar gets a little bit of a shake and it sort of bubbles up to the surface again. But we've now got so much more in our life that we can sort of attach, like we can sort of grab from all of these new wonderful parts of life and it's no longer consuming every fiber mm. that is. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Sarah. I really like the way you just explained that then. That's really nice. Mm. I'm definitely feeling so emotional during this talk. I don't know how you're feeling or how anyone listening is feeling right now. (laughs) Downside of doing a live event, can't pause it to have a quick cry off screen and then come back. So I'm going to hold it together for the rest of the chat, even though it's not going to get easier. (laughs) So I'm going to make a joke and laugh because that's how I cope through... uh, yeah, I'm feeling uncomfortable. Same. If you see me <sighs> start smiling, smiling awkwardly, it's because, you know, that's, <laughs> my, that's my coping mechanism. Yeah, I think we need a minute to take a deep breath mm. just collectively. Okay, centre again. It's okay. It's okay to feel this way. And for anyone listening, we notice you. We see you. Yeah. Let's move into the topic of motherhood. I just yeah. realized I'm, I'm leading this. I apologize. I'm not doing very well at the turntables. Um, <laughs> so I've had a lot of chats through the summit and quite a few of them have revolved around the shift that we experience in motherhood. And that shift you can feel perhaps even each time you have a child, right? Not, uh, but mostly the first time. Um, and so I've had a talk with Nikki around matrescence, um, Rochelle, and I also talked a bit about that. And I think it's worth having discussion about how we can experience grief and loss in 
that because yeah. yes we know that becoming a mother is a beautiful wonderful thing for a lot of us um some of us have desperately wanted it for a long time um that can also make it harder when you realize why am I feeling this way why am I having these um really difficult emotions it's not as easy as I thought it was going to be um I'm really tired no one told me that kids don't sleep for like three years um breastfeeding is a struggle it, it hurts it's awkward I'm trying to figure this out my tummy's really squishy like I don't recognize who I see in the mirror um my relationship yeah. is falling it's apart possible. like it's all confusing right yeah. like there's so much that goes on um that is unnoticed because it's always the focus on the baby yes and not on the mother like we focus so much on the birth plan or all the appointments we have in the lead up and then what happens after but you look at the hospital system as well you know after birth you'll get you know a check on you know day one and day three and then like week six or something like that mm. meanwhile the baby's got all these checks for like yeah. the first two years you know there's someone checking in on the baby through you know if you use those systems but even mm. if you don't you know there's there's the support built for the baby but you know we sort of where's the support built yeah, for mum we forget about the mums yeah. and I think you know in talking about the the transition in motherhood and the loss of um, ourselves, I think it's forward and backward because yes, we've yeah. got, you know, we've got dreams. I dreamt about being a mum since I was a little girl, like mm. three and I was breastfeeding my baby sort of thing. Like obviously <laughs> not, but pretending, you know, mm. I dreamed my plans, my, my school school plans and what courses I was going to do after and what career I was going to do, do after were built around me being a stay-at-home mum you know that was something I had imagined my whole life and then when you enter motherhood and it's not what you it doesn't play out like how you expected yeah. it it's not it's not easy. like the movies <laughs> it's not like the movies and it's not as easy and it's loud and suddenly we realize our own triggers for some reason we don't tend to realize how many triggers we have and I was one of those people that found out I had an anger issue after I had kids who pushed those buttons. Yeah. I didn't know, but I had yeah. an underlying thing of anger that I had to deal with. Mm. So there's like this forward and backward thing where not only we're grieving the loss of this, you know, the, the, re the, the reality didn't play out the way that we thought it did, yes. but we're also grieving the past too mm. and what used to be. So it's like this forward, backward thing where yes. both ways we feel like, there's a disconnect mm, and it's like being in limbo isn't it because yeah. you know and you remember who you were before you had children like you either remember clearly with your memory or um things you used to enjoy or things you used to do um or you have pictures of them especially you know if that's related to body image and how different you look and feel in your body now um well, what is about like travel or career or yes you know, your relationships or seriously like you could just <laughs> like we went and watched movies every weekend we would go want to go see a movie tonight check your phone in an hour yes walk out the door <laughs> should we go to a winery this weekend or you know do you yeah. want to fly into state you know all of those sorts of yeah. things you know, they're, they're no longer just part of the reality yeah um, we can stay up till 3 a.m because we can sleep in till 2 p.m if we want to tomorrow you know all, all these things you could do um that you cannot once you become a mother and and I say this lighthearted and it's a joke because obviously we knew we wouldn't do those things necessarily but in saying that, it's not even that. It goes deeper than that. A lot of people feel like, who am I? Because all of a sudden you take on this role and this new hat of mother. And we have so many preconceptions and ideas about what a mother is supposed to look like and should do. And, you know, once you start noticing language around supposed to and should, I always like people to really tap into where it's that coming from. So the social platforms are so loud for that. Yes. Like you look at Pinterest, Facebook, Instagram, and everything else that's coming out. Mm. You know, it all just amplifies that. Yeah, yeah. And and whatever we experience with our parents as well, whatever, however our mom presented themselves and their mother, and you know, all that kind of intergenerational stuff that happens there too. Um, 
and it's very multifaceted and, and, and runs very deep. And I think at the core of it, it's kind of the same thing that we're experiencing, which is just that, like you said, we feel that disconnect. Um, and we're not quite sure how to deal with it because you're scared. You're scared if you talk up about it, that people are going to judge you or that people won't be able to relate. And that judgment comes from fear of, of people are going to think I'm a bad mom. Yes. Or that or, I should just be grateful for being a mom and like, yes. or I wanted I- this. I asked for this. This was my choice. I did this to myself. Maybe you even have someone actually saying those things to you, which is really unkind and very dismissive as well. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, and it's something where, again, you know, we're not really taught how to process this, but more than that, we've lost the village of people that were supposed to. I was just about to say that. Shoulder mm. us through that transition and yeah. help us, you know, not only... With, with the village there, with the yeah. village, we would have been exposed to what life was as a mother. Mm. And not only were you not left alone as a mother to try work it out, but you were exposed to how it was and you had a community to lean on. And we've yes. lost that. <laughs> so, yeah. And you know, to pick up on other areas that don't that shouldn't matter when you have a baby. You yes. know, like housework and, and, and cleaning, um, cooking, um, I don't know, all those things. Um, even caring for older children, all of that should be shared. Like it'd be nice if it was shared, if we had that sense of a village back. We used to live in those tight-knit communities. It's just in our Westernized society and modern society, we've lost all of that. We're all in our own houses, don't even know your neighbours and, you know, families like all over the place. Or if you're getting to this point in your parenting journey where you're adopting more of that gentler attachment approach, perhaps you're also realizing problematic family members. So maybe you are also making the choice to distance yourself from them. Um, It's really tough. It's really hard to find that support that is lacking so much. And also, again, it's like that's another thing to do. Yeah, like that's also hard as well. Is like okay, so now I also have to go out and find this village. Like, where is the village? <laughs> you have to search for it. You know, if you if you are working to break cycles and mm. to change parenting that you were given, you're reaching into brand new communities that you weren't part of before. You know, yeah. you, you you have to look for them. We shouldn't yeah. have to, but that is how it's being left. Yes. Is they're not just. They're not necessarily, they might be, but they're not necessarily the mums at the local playgroup or the mums mm. at the cafe or at the park. You might have to look a little bit further to find those mums that mm. are thinking, you know, thinking the way that you want to be thinking as a parent. Yes, and something that I noticed as well is that we're all actually, I shouldn't say all, but a lot of us who feel this way, what we want is actually deeper connection not the superficial stuff like you if you can relate to that where you get really sick of every mommy group event or chat just revolving around the babies and the feeding and the sleep and and the rolling over and when are you going back to work and I don't know like all that kind of basic everyday chit chat stuff but a lot of us are like you know I want to talk about like how I'm getting triggered like let's talk about our childhood trauma like I want, I want to get to know you on like a much deeper level. And I feel like that's really lacking. We're missing those deep connections. And I think you experienced that as well when you were shifting from um, that maiden to then mother. So like who you were before you had your baby and perhaps you did have that. And then friendships have changed or have lost, has been lost as well. Or if you're the first to have a child in your friendship group and so they can't, relate on that level so then you're chucked into this new role of mother and it's like okay what does that look like now it feels like this huge responsibility I feel like I'm supposed to know what I'm doing I feel like I'm at the peak of adulthood because now I have to care for an entire human being um but I think then we realize like I'm still growing up and if you've had children younger like um below 30 because we know our brains don't even finish developing till like 25 right so if you've had children younger you are also still growing up as you're raising them too. And, and that's something you don't realize in the moment. You kind of are able to reflect on that later and after and go, wow, like I have to go through so much still myself. 
And that was that was a realization that actually hit me in the last 12 months. I messaged, I remember messaging you about yeah, it. And I'm like about it. friends. And I'm I've never seen all the friends, but what's hitting me is the fact that they're all searching for someone to complete them. Mm. And um, there was this realization for me that having been married at 19 and then fallen pregnant for the first time at 20, I sort of missed that maiden phase of finding myself Mm. and you know grounding myself in my values and you know those growth phases those searching phases yeah and so that's been really interesting for me to process in the last you know six to 12 months is who am I Mm. and who am I separate from these things that currently define me Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah. yeah it's so interesting I like hearing your perspective on that because um how old I think I was 25 when I had my first but I felt like I was 35 <laughs> so I feel like I did have a good period of time where I I did have a space to figure out a bit about who I was I don't know why people talk about that in your teenage years I swear your 20s is for that like the 20s is for you such growth I feel and we're not me, wise and mature enough to do that stuff in our teenage. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't have that. We don't really have the wisdom to be yeah. searching for that stuff. It's like the beginning of figuring it out, but I feel like that's more yeah. social as well because um, friendships is so like important in those teenage years. And then it's like that deeper connection you're seeing, seeking with other people, like you were saying, like trying to find the other part to complete them or whatever it is. Um, and so then I feel like we get to this stage where it's like we're trying to revisit ourselves, but we don't know how to do that because we also don't even have the breathing space all the time to do that because we are constantly having to tend to the children. So it's really frustrating when you're trying to balance that as well. And so a lot of people feel that loss of who they were because it's it's really easy to get stuck on that and hung up on it. Um, and I think it's really hard to make a shift into okay, how can I look at motherhood as more of an opportunity for self-growth and to expand in this new role and to expand in who I am in motherhood? Like, who am I as a mother, but not not just as a mother for my children, but like for me? Because I feel like now what I've started learning is I've been mothering myself, if that makes sense. And I think that also has come from being on my inner healing journey and doing a lot of um, reparenting and inner child work. I'm also actually missing a maternal figure in my life um, by choice. I don't have a relationship with her. So I've also had that realization that I can be that person for myself and I like that person. It's like growing to appreciate and and like who you're growing into um I I know a lot of people in the spiritual community kind of talk of it as your higher self or your higher being um I think that's another way to sort of explain it but it's it's interesting yeah it's interesting trying to get to like what does that even look like what is the end goal I don't even know if you can actually measure that I feel like it's just this process and I don't even think that it's linear there are some days where I still feel awful and like I can't get together. And my husband and I have indulged in a couple of chats about like, wow, imagine what we'd be doing right now if we didn't have the kids and we love them dearly, but it's still interesting to think like how different life could be. Yeah. And when you see other people who don't have children as well um, and, it, and people are doing it by choice now, which I also think is great that people are looking at it like you have a choice. You don't have to get married and have children, which is so drilled into us as well. And so that's really hard too. I think some people like I, um, as well come to that realization of, did I actually even want children? And that's a really hard thing to come by too. Um, I can't speak per- from personal experience of that. I just wanted to kind of acknowledge it in case someone is listening to this who can relate to that because that's really hard yeah that's a hard thing to process can't take it back can't put that back in (laughs) no and it it doesn't like when we talked about before being able to experience multiple feelings Mm -hmm. having those feelings and sitting with that thought of did I want to be a mum was I ready to be a mum yes was I ready doesn't take away from the fact that you love your kids 
Yes. Or, you know, that... It, it is, it's the it end. The end matters. Yes. I miss who I was and I love my children. Yes. You can have yes. both at the same yes. time. Yeah. Yes. Our brains are capable of, like, that many thoughts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that many feelings all at once. Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 And you had um, you had a, another part to sort of build onto a third part of grief to build onto motherhood here too yeah and we all know what we're in the pandemic and Mm -hmm. I had the realization today because I said 2019 and I was like fire out 22 is only like two months away now um we've been in this thing for a long time yeah and that is another aspect of the unnoticed grief and loss Um, So for me, with my personal experience with it, um, being locked down in Australia, so we can't travel, um, I have family spread out a bit. So for me, it's been really hard because uh, right before the pandemic hit, um, like we kind of knew about it because my my eldest brother uh, works in Hong Kong and it was happening over there first. So we knew before really it was hitting news in Australia. Um, but my dad was planning on retiring and coming back to Australia because he lives in Dubai and we were so excited. Um, so for people that don't know, um, I went to boarding school, all my siblings did. So for us, we've been, we've had a lot of separation in our family dynamic. Um, and that's been by distance a lot as well, like literally overseas, different countries. Um, so for me, I already had the struggle of feeling like I've lost time with my family. So we were super excited um, for him to come home and then literally everything shut down. So that's been really hard to go through. Um, my daughter as well, who grew surprisingly and very quickly close to what we call granddad, um, has wrestled with that very frequently. She is talking about missing him and wanting to see him again. Um, I also have older parents, so I'm hyper aware that that is limited time and that's a really upsetting thing to grapple with. So I am probably still in the anger phase of grief because I'm just angry at the loss of time that I have and already had, like the loss of time being in boarding school, the loss of time in separate countries, and then now the pandemic. It feels like it's stolen moments for me. And even though I can relate to that with my dad being overseas, people are experiencing that within Australia with the different states, right? I know a lot of people have family within different states that can probably relate to that as well. And I think my heart breaks more for people who are becoming first time moms or having pregnancies during this time and are missing that support network like we were talking about earlier. Um, And I feel like there's a lot of moments that have been taken from us. Oh yeah. A lot of memories lost. Like we had so many plans, whether it was for seeing people or or certain events, um, special things that we have not been able to have. And I think that's a really awful thing that a lot of people have been going through that we are not talking about enough at all. Like I don't think anyone's talking about that at all, actually. I I think I've seen conversations talking about our kids and how much our kids are missing out on. Yeah, but it's like missing school or or yeah, or yeah. you know, missing missing out on birthday parties or yes. Yes. um, you know, I'm in regional Victoria, so we haven't had it as hard as Melbourne. You know, my heart breaks for the guys in Melbourne mm. and in Sydney. We're still under. We haven't been able to have people in our homes since I think June or July, mm. something like that. You know, we haven't been able to visit with friends and family Mm -hmm. and have people over for meals and you know those sorts of things and Mm -hmm. there's a lot of conversation around what our kids are missing out on Mm -hmm. and um you know how we can support our kids you're right there's not a lot of conversation happening around what that means for mums and what mums dreamed of what parenthood was going to be and what Mm mums dreamed of you know the mummy daughter classes they were going to do yeah. or the mummy the the daddy daughter dates or whatever it might be where we're really the first day of school yeah yeah you know all of those things or mm. even getting to you know to take their kid to a, a graduation thing you know mm. we're we're really not talking a lot about what that means for the parents and what 
hopes and dreams parents have placed mm-hmm. upon what parenthood was supposed to look like. And I think that we are possibly accidentally doing what you were, we've been talking about, about not processing grief because yeah. it's kind of like we feel like we need to be really strong for our kids, but I feel like we're doing it to the point of acting like it's not happening. Yeah. And Especially for those with all... little kids who you're trying to protect yes. and not scare and they can't really understand what's happening anyway. But at the same time, we are still feeling that way. And we're not processing it. And it's also that going back to that idea of having to sort of validate our feelings as well. Mm-hmm. I know that there's a lot of people who are like, oh, I'm really struggling with this, but and then they brush it under the carpet because at mm. least it's not as bad yes. as well. Yes, and like, so like you even crazy. kind of did that just then, yeah. talking about, you know, I haven't had it as bad as Melbourne. Here I am sitting in Queensland as well, by the way, where really we've had it pretty damn good. And I we are very aware of that. My husband and I, we've actually been very aware of how we we're quite lucky just by its luck, just by yeah. luck that we happen to be living in Queensland compared to the other places that have been locked down far worse, and- far longer. And I think like there's two ways to look at that and but thing is you can either dismiss Mm. your reality to acknowledge someone else's or you can acknowledge both and you can say I see you and I see that your struggle is big. Mm. You know, we're, we're allowed to acknowledge both. Yeah. Let's not acknowledge both to dismiss your like the validity of your feelings though yeah that makes sense yeah Yeah. and I think that's kind of like with my story is probably a bit more unique I would think because typically people have their family close by not living as expats which is how I grew up so yeah for me it's like yeah I have a loss because my dad is literally across the ocean and can't get to me but at the same time here are people with like a border and the same thing cannot get across to see each other so we are all experienced this loss of loved ones in that capacity of we're not having the time with them, we're not seeing them, we're not having these memories and moments together. And we feel that loss for ourselves. And like you said, we feel that loss for our children because they're missing out on certain things as well. Um, and it's really hard because we're still in it. Yeah. <laughs> like it hasn't so- ended either. <laughs> So I think that's also why no one's processing it because you can't process it yet because you're going through it still. We're in it still. We, we can acknowledge it though. Yes. So I had I had a really um, an interesting one last year. I worked really hard to get through the certificate in accounting and bookkeeping. Um, and it was really hard work running a business and parenting and homeschooling and studying. You know, it was really hard work. And I've had a lot of problems completing stuff as an adult, which is a whole other conversation. <laughs> it wasn't the first certificate I started. And, you know, it probably won't be the last. But I pushed through it and I completed it and I was looking so forward to actually deserving to be recognised in graduation. Mm. And then graduation got cancelled. Yeah. And... I didn't know what to do with that because it was only a certificate for, you know, that was the thought going through my head. And you're using the word only. Yeah. You know, that was the thought going through my head up only a certificate for it's no big deal. You know, what are you complaining about? And I had to sort of stop and go, you know what though, but I, I deserved that. I worked hard for that. It was a big deal. Mm. I worked until two o'clock in the morning. I got my assignments done. You know, I worked hard and I wanted to acknowledge that mm. and I wanted someone else to acknowledge that yes. too, yes. you know. Um, it's okay to want people to acknowledge your achievements as well. Yeah, and as mums, yeah. I mean, when as mums when we reach out to complete something, you know, we, we set out to do something, there is so much, it's complicated, you know. We don't get to just hit stop on everything else. As mm-hmm. mums, we, when we set our minds There's a lot of barriers. Yeah, there's a lot of barriers. We have to overcome a lot as mums to be able to, you know, go, you know, I did that. I built that. I created that. I finished that, whatever it was. There's a lot of barriers in front of us to do it. And for a lot of mums, we have lost that recognition of the amazing things that we've done in the last 18 months. You know, we've, it's, 
it's so much more than just motherhood. It's so much more than missing out on, you know, play dates and concerts and things like that. It is so much more than motherhood. It's all the things that we've worked so hard for, mm. we've dreamed of, um, and then sort of losing that. Yeah. It's, it's so big and it's really something that a lot of processing is going to have to be done about in the future. Yes. Yeah. I'm very aware um, in my practice as a counsellor that I'm always going to need to ask clients to tell me about what they went through during this time because yeah. we're all, it's, it's collective trauma. Everyone has been traumatised. Um, you can't compare trauma. Um, the analogy I, I like to use is you drown no matter how shallow or how deep the water is. Yep. And when you go through something traumatic, it's not necessarily the thing that traumatizes you. What we get traumatized from is whether we're able to have someone sit with us during that and the level of our ability to cope through it. Yes. That is how you get traumatized if you don't, if you're not supported through that. And, and especially tr- now when we are literally separated, we, yeah. can't, we, we aren't supporting each other, which also makes me so grateful for the internet <laughs> and being yes. connected at least through things like social media and, and you know, we're on Zoom right now, um, but we're also missing like human touch and human connection and there's a lot of value in that as well. So it's really tricky in a lot of ways and um who knows how much longer we're going to be in this thing anyway but there's a lot of healing that needs to happen there's a lot of healing that needs to happen and it's going to take time yes and we need to be very patient and very gentle with ourselves and practice a lot of that self-compassion and kindness because we're going to keep having those moments of being pissed off of what we went through pissed off of those moments lost like you you're going to keep returning to those stages of grief like we were talking about it's not linear you're going to keep going you're going to have moments where you go back to that as well and that's going to be with us forever as well like we I don't think we truly understand the weight of what we're going through um right now because we're in like a pretty impressive part of history we're living it so it's going to be really weird to look back when we're telling the the tales to our grandchildren about back in my day we couldn't even go outside. <laughs> so on a more serious note, what advice would you have for someone who, what strategies would you give someone who is dealing with a grief that they feel like they have to validate? They feel like they're not maybe entitled to talk about it or they don't know how to process it. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what would you say to them? Okay. On an individual level, I think that when you notice, you you need to notice if you're seeking that validation from others and realizing sometimes there are moments where we have to do that for ourselves. Um, So for me, I'm a big fan of things like journaling because it feels like you're talking to someone um, mm. and, but you can sit with your private thoughts and do it at your own pace as well. And, and you can really think about what you want to write about or just write and just let it kind of flow. However, it's going or to do flow. it by voice demo or video yes. or, you know, however yes. you need to get those words out. It doesn't have to be written. Yeah. yeah. It could even, I mean, you can even just have a conversation with yourself out loud in the shower if you wanted to. I mean, yeah. I've done that as well. I've typed letters, you know, I, I struggle to consistently journal, but when there's something really big, I've found actually yes. I'm a writer. So, mm. um, and typing a letter mm. to the person or the topic that I want to sort yeah, of yeah yeah and so I think as cheesy or as simple as it sounds I think it's really important yeah. to use some sort of a method like that to acknowledge and validate yourself so you know how we talk a lot about like in gentle parenting how you need to um acknowledge your child's feelings and validate their experience and comfort them you need to turn that advice around and do it for yourself so you need to acknowledge how you're feeling like I'm feeling really angry right now I'm feeling really depressed right now. Uh, Validate what you're going through. Like this has been an immensely hard three years because like, let's be real, it's like three years now, you know, with the pandemic anyway, or, you know, with the other things we've talked about, like this has been a really hard loss to go through. Um, I'm feeling alone. I'm separated from people right now, you know, whatever acknowledgement and validation you need. And then it's about 
allowing yourself to feel those feelings um, in that moment because if you don't, you're just going to suppress it and it will show up in other ways, whether it's going to come out as physical pain, um, whether it's going to affect your parenting and, and make you be on um, like a bubbling surface. Like I like to think of it like a volcano. You're going to kind of be on that bubbling edge the whole time and like a small thing can set you off. So then you're not going to feel great about how you're parenting. And that's going to add to how you're feeling. Um, so you really do need to be, allow yourself to feel angry and to feel sad. And I talk about that more specifically because for a lot of us um, growing up, we were not allowed to feel those feelings. You were told to suck it up. Um, it wasn't accepted. You were told to go to your room or to stop crying, stop being dramatic. And so recognizing that's really uncomfortable to feel those feelings um, because you've got this narration that it means you're bad or something's wrong with you or whatever it is. Um, when people tell me they feel angry, I'm like, good, feel angry, scream. Like scream into your pillow. Let yourself be angry. Let yourself feel that hotness, you know, come over you. I'm not talking about in those moments, like with parenting, I mean, when you've taken that time to sit with yourself, like let that happen. You, you need to get that out of your system. Um, it can even be through moving your body as well. Um, it could be a gentle stretch. It could be going for a run. It could be like shaking, um, getting it out of your body some sort of way like that. So yes, definitely think about um, connecting with yourself and processing those emotions. I do believe that we need to move past from this idea that we're supposed to deal with things individually. Um, and I'm a big believer in community and healing yeah. through community. So if you are able to have freedoms, um, I would actually really recommend finding something like a women's circle first and foremost, because I've had personal experience with them. We've had um, a couple of speakers on actually that run women's circles. There's a lot of um, power in them because that is where you're going to find like-minded people because they're all going there for a similar or same reason, which is essentially to find a community of people to be seen and heard um, and to be vulnerable and talk about deep and hurtful things. So that would be a great thing to look into. Um, and that's also yeah, not like mother's like groups, you know? Either. Yeah. 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 It kind of has a similar feel to what we did at the very beginning, like with the candle yeah. and, and the deep breaths and, and just as a nice space. Um, outside of that, it would be if you, whatever relationships you currently have to let people love you, um, you will know who are the people that you can open up to and who are the people you can't. So what I mean by that is sometimes you might be able to think of someone where um, when you tell them that you're having that you're having a hard time they reply by saying that they also have a hard time uh, but it's like worse than yours <laughs> so like don't go to the one upper um, or think about the boundary you can set like hey I'm feeling really upset right now um, are you in the headspace to be here for me emotionally so I think there's also a good way to kind of respect other people and be like, hey, how are you feeling? Because I'm feeling really crap and I need someone to be there for me. But if you're feeling crap, like I totally understand if you can't handle it or hey, let's feel crap together and have like a good cry, whatever it is. So I think um, having open and honest conversations with people around you like that is really good. Um, and with relationships, uh, especially for anyone that can relate to a husband that's like a problem solver saying like, hey, I'm really upset. I don't want you to fix it. I want you to listen um, can be a really helpful like sentence starter to make sure that they're in that right headspace for you. And that and happens with female relationships as well because we've got like yes. this, this undertone of toxic yes. positivity that's happening. Mm -hmm. And so it's not uncommon to reach out to a friend and say, today was really shit. And they're like, oh, well, why don't you put your phone down and go for a walk? Yeah. Or, you know, did you try did you try journaling? And we've just talked about journaling. Journaling is really great. But in that moment when you're reaching out for a friend, that might not be what you're looking for. So this idea mm. of, well, just say an affirmation or go for a walk and it's fine, mm. you know, there's this toxic positivity that can yeah. sometimes play out when you are looking for that and person. And people are well-meaning. Like they really don't yeah. realise that they're doing it. I'm sure I've done it as well oh, without realising it. So that's why I think it's it's good to, in your message or whatever you're saying to this person, acknowledge that and, and right. say, uh, this is what I'm needing from you. I need someone to be here to listen to me right now. I no, don't, don't need prob uh, solutions. Yeah, I just yeah. need you to be with. And, and that's the power of being with someone is that 90% of the time you just want someone to be with you as you're having those uncomfortable emotions. You just want to be seen and heard. You don't want to be fixed. 
Um, another way to find community is um, I'm a big fan of online um, and social media um, because uh, there's a, a an art to finding your like-minded community. So be really specific in your searches um, with like the parenting communities or, or whatever it might be that you want to reach out to. Um, and, and I think it's important to acknowledge that because some people are actually like really isolated or in rural areas where they don't have people around. Um, yeah, so it, it's first look at who you have in your current life that you can let love you and then go from there. So I do think it's really important to reach out and have that community aspect to it as well. Um, and then if you feel like um, how you're feeling is affecting your day-to-day -day life um, and it doesn't seem to be going away, or if you have a history of something like depression, for example, um, I would be getting more in contact with a professional. And like Sarah and I said at the beginning, um, we will include some information at the end of this um, on all the various ways that we're sharing this um, with some of that information. It's, it's on my website all the time as well. If you go to the terms and conditions page on my website at thegentlecouncil.com and scroll literally to the end, I always have on there um, the phone numbers and contacts for uh, everywhere in the world or at least every place I could find. So not just Australia specific. Um, so yeah, definitely you can use a free service that way. Or if you're in Australia, you can go to your GP and you can get a mental health care plan, which gives you Medicare rebate sessions with a psychologist. In saying that, I want to acknowledge that there are ridiculously huge waiting lists um, for a lot of psychologists at the moment because of that. So I do encourage you to look at alternatives like counselors, for example, um, which is what I am, um, because we don't fall into that category with the Medicare system, which is a conversation for another day, why that's problematic. Um, so yeah, look for counselling services that fall outside of psychology as well. Um, and look at other options like life coaching. Like it's okay to find an alternative that kind of sits right and feels right for you. Um, people that do emotional freedom technique. I know we've had Erin, who's been one of our um, supporters in yes. this. You know, there are, there are other people out there um, even Jess and I had a really great conversation about getting in touch with your body, um, more through like, uh, uh, whether it's like physical therapy or massage therapy or whatever it might be. Like there's a few other options as well to look into that can be very healing as well. Um, but yeah, I, I really do think in those more serious, um, cases, how you're feeling, definitely getting professional mental health help, um, is the ideal. Absolutely. So I am conscious of the time. Um, we have talked a lot. Um, so we might leave it there if you're okay yeah. and we can come back if people want to take some time to process this mm. and um, either engage with what's been said or ask questions. Um, we can come back to the comments. Would you like to finish with telling people where they can... Um, you share so much content on reparenting ourselves and... Um, looking after our own mental health as mums and what we can really be doing to take care of ourselves in a real practical way. So where can people find that information? Yeah, so um, my website is thegentlecounselor.com. I have my membership, Gentle Motherhood, which is where I support you in that inner healing and parenting journey more specifically. So that is a space for mums. Um, I have courses as well available. Um, I've got so many things. I've got a journaling ebook that will take <laughs> you through that process. I've got emotional regulation ebook, which are currently I have a fifty percent off discount code through this event. If you want to access that as well, um, I do social security parenting program. I offer my counselling services, um, which can be online or in person if you're on the Gold Coast. And I do have availability um, for new clients. So if you're looking for that, that is an option for you as well. Um, I have my Gentle Counselor podcast, which I haven't uploaded to for a while, but there's a lot of good stuff on there. I'm most There's present on um, Instagram. Too. I'm most present on yes. Instagram. That's where I live. <laughs> yeah, and, I, hey, and I'm there Facebook every day. And, and you pop up in a whole and bunch TikTok, of I'm, I'm everywhere. It depends yeah. on what you're looking for. <laughs> I, I'm here for yes. you and your healing journey. I'm here for you and your parenting journey. Um, next year, I'm going to be bringing out things for professionals working with mothers. I'm bringing out my gentle motherhood framework. So if you're a professional, keep an eye out for that. Um, I'm really yes. excited to be bringing that next year as well. I'm really looking forward to seeing all that come to fruition. Um, so we might leave it there. Thank you very much, Crystal. For, Thank you, um... Sarah. Thanks for being here with me. It was nice doing this with you.
Yeah. And it's been, you know, it's been a big three days. So hats off to you for having all of those conversations and putting so much energy into actually connecting in each of those conversations. Yeah, so thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, and please let us know if you're watching the replay and um, what you take away from it. Bye. Bye, everyone.